Hello, young E2C scholars. Dr. Randolph coming to you from virtual Kenya. I'd like to share with you some notes about Derek Walcott's phenomenal poem, A Far Cry from Africa. So without further ado, let's share a screen and take a look. Here we go. All right. In the first stanza, we are, we are given the scene of Africa. A wind is ruffling the tawny pelt of Africa. Kukuyu, quick as flies, batten upon the bloodstreams of the veld. So a couple of rhetorical issues right off the bat, a couple of rhetorical features, I should say. One of which is the, uh, the description of the landscape as being a tawny pelt. Tawny represents a kind of color, uh, something along the lines of uh, light brown, khaki, um, sort of a light dirt colored. <clears throat> but pelt, a pelt is uh, an animal skin that's been taken off the animal. And this, this inference is important for us to make. This implication is important for the poet to make because uh, an animal, uh, has been skinned and and it is going to be used for some other purpose here we see we see it as the landscape the landscape has somehow been been uh, taken from its natural its natural um, sort of purpose <clears throat> then you have kukuyu quick as flies batten upon the bloodstreams of the veld so the Kukuyu are a tribe that live in Kenya. Walcott chooses to describe them as like flies, like, like uh, uh, you know, the, the, this deteriorating natural uh, um, creature uh, that, that lays eggs, which, which then become maggots, which then become flies, which, which eat up dead things, carcasses. And that, that's nature's way of, of cleaning up everything. So to, to liken a people to being flies is, that's not obviously a complimentary thing. One has to wonder, why is the poet doing this? Okay. Then we have this interesting phrase, batten upon the blood streams. You will recall that the repetition of consonant sounds uh, is a rhetorical device. It goes all the way back to the Anglo-Saxons in their poetry, as you'll recall. And it's called alliteration, alliteration. Batten upon the bloodstreams. Batten is an interesting word too. And that word is, is oftentimes associated with uh, managing sails on a ship uh, or managing a ship. Uh, you batten down the hatches, you, you, you tighten these things up, you close them up nice and secure. <clears throat> so it has a sense, it has a sense of, of kind of inappropriate diction. In other words, one doesn't batten things down on the veld. The veld is, is what you would call the, um, the landscape, the flat uh, landscape, a grassy landscape of, of Africa, sort of like what we have back here before Kilimanjaro. Now look, the next lines are, are very similar. Corpses are scattered through a paradise. Only the worm, kernel of carrion, cries, waste no compassion on these separate dead. So let's go a line at a time. Corpses are scattered. So dead bodies, they're scattered. Um, the way you would throw your clothes off at the end of the day, you, you're not folding them up and putting them back where they ought to be. You're carelessly, recklessly littering these things. So it's, it's, hor it's horrific enough to think about corpses, but then reckless sort of um, littering of corpses on the landscape, they're scattered. Th that seems like an inappropriate term for, for a corpse, something that's been killed, uh, murdered. Uh, you, you, don't, you scatter seeds, you don't scatter corpses. So we, we get a, a feel for the tone, it's the tone is is almost like uh, a, a bowling ball 
uh, when you're bowling on an alley with those gutter guards and it sort of hits one guard and then it goes to the other side and hits the other. It's, it's careening, we might say. The tone is careening here between uh, the sort of, of um, impersonal kind of uh, empir uh, uh, empirical sort of diction and uh, a kind of very vivid description. Now, my question would be, why, is, why are the corpses in, in a paradise? Why not paradise? Why do we need a paradise? Why isn't it capitalized? Usually we think of paradise as being either an incredibly beautiful place, like it is the most beautiful place in the world, like, I don't know, the Maldives, Tahiti, Hawaii, something like that, <coughs> are often called paradises. But, but in Judeo-Christian thought, the original paradise is Eden. It's Edenic, before there was any sin. But here we have a paradise. Now, just the grammatical setup here suggests that there is more than one paradise. Also, it's not a proper noun. It is not paradise as in Eden. There may be many, it's a descriptor. There may be many paradises, as I said. Uh, anyone can find a paradise. Hopefully your own home is a paradise for you. So, so corpses are scattered through this one paradise. It suggests that the, the, the mentality, the tone from which the, um, the poet is trying to speak this poem it has been to multiple paradises. This is just one of them, right? And again, I guess I would say this, if you take a look at Kilimanjaro here, or if you go to the Victoria Falls, both of which I'd like to do on my bucket list, then I think you would say that Africa has a strong claim to being paradise. All right, next line, only the worm. So the worm is, uh, it, it is uh, maggots, right? It's the, it, it is the worm that comes from the, the eggs that the flies will lay. So the worm, uh, it, it, it um, eats up the, the flesh. And again, that's how nature, nature cleans up the, the, um, the various uh, bodies that are left on, uh, on the felt. Only the worm. And then the worm is described as as kernel of carrion, and it cries. So there's alliteration again. We, repetition breeds intention. This alliteration is not for nothing, all right? It's supposed to mean something, okay? And also, this constant careening back and forth between vivid natural imagery and this sort of um, imperial kind of imagery. Kernel of carrion. Carrion, again, th those are, those are um, uh, animals or or insects that eat flesh. And again, they, they're nature's cleanup crew. So what does the maggot, the cleanup crew of all of these corpses, this is again, nature's way of dealing with things in the same way that as Yates pointed out, nature has causation. Things just as, you know, they move uh, uh, according to nature's plan. That's what the seasons are all about. <clears throat> but here's what, the, here's what the worm cries. Waste no compassion on these separate dead. Okay, before we get to compassion, let's talk about separate dead. Now, you can look at it in a number of different ways. You could see it as separate as individuals. That, in other words, don't think about these, these corpses as individuals, because if you do, then, you're going to be overwhelmed with compassion. You're not going to make good policy decisions, right? The other is that you have sides and, and don't, don't uh, waste your emotion trying to figure out which side is right or wrong. So again, uh, the poet embraces this ambiguity and doesn't ask us to sort it out. We're supposed to see this ambiguity of of sides and of individuals. Now let's go back to compassion. Compassion is what human beings feel. Compassion uh, literally means to share suffering with people. So a, a simple way of describing it is looking at someone and saying, well, there but for the grace of God go I. I know what it feels like to X, Y, or Z. 
Now, it is popular these days for good political reasons for, for people to be careful not to assume that they can that they can feel what other people have felt when they haven't really, right? It's, uh, it, it's absurd, uh, I think, uh, to, to compare um, sheltering in place and following that, that um, directive to being rounded up and taken to concentration camps. This is what a, a lawmaker in Alaska did. Right, that that's not appropriate. That's that's intellectually um, mistaken. Um, it is it's highly politically motivated and highly highly politically charged. So one has to be careful about compassion, right? Uh, but I will tell you, if you have if you have experienced death in your family, then you you have a sense of compassion for people who are experiencing death in their family. I mean, even if you've lost a pet uh, that whom you loved. You, uh, you understand loss and, and you feel compassion and, and that compassion can jump across all sorts of different identities, right? And it, it's the thing that's supposed to keep us all human and make us human. At the end of the day, we should stop uh, what we're doing if, if it destroys our compassion. Again, this is a, an important theme that Yeats takes up in Easter 1916. But the kernel of carrion says waste no compassion on these separate dead. But of course, Carrion, the, the kernel of Carrion, the worm would say that because it wants to eat on the corpses. It needs more corpses, right? Moving on, then we see statistics justify and scholars seize. Can you hear the syllabants, the S sounds? All right, it sounds like a snake hissing, right? Statistics justify and scholars seize the salience of colonial policy, right? So let's talk about what it means before how it feels. What it means is this. If we break down the numbers, it's a smart move to uh, oppress people. It's a good economic uh, policy. So let's do it or let's not undo it. Uh, Britain should keep Kenya. Britain should keep India. Britain should keep, um, you know, what they hold in China. Never mind the opium wars. Never mind um, all of the atrocities um, in India. Never mind all of that. Statistics justify. If we are just looking as an economist, this is what we will see. Oh yeah, I mean, there's going to be some destructive, but we call that creative destruction in, ec in economics. Right, because a new thing will give birth. You know, uh, you don't just uh, you you don't double down on horses and buggies when someone's building the automobile, right? That's the arg That's the economic argument. There's some wisdom to that. But what Walcott seems to be saying is that that it doesn't take much of a jump to go from yeah, people need to retrain themselves for new jobs to yeah, um, sweatshops really make our economy hum in the United States. Yeah, um, you know, um, being able to depress wages and, and have child labor, that's a smart economic move. It really is good for our economy, right? So, so where do you draw the line between, between good policy and bad morality? That's, that is the implication here. And, and we're starting to see the tone come into focus. The tone is some is 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 kind of what you'd call pejorative. It undercuts. Pejorative means it undercuts the things we might we might say facetious. We might say uh, sarcastic, but it's not quite sarcastic. It's more it's more serious than that. It's not being smarmy like a child. It's really trying to call our attention uh, to um, to an attitude which is destructive. Okay and. And in finishing up the last two lines, this is, the, this is the bell that the poet wants to ring. What is that to the white child hacked in bed to savages expendable as Jews? So first things first, the white child hacked to death in bed by machetes is not an abstraction. 
It is not a metaphor. It is an allusion to a real historic event of a child named Michael Rucker, who along with, he was six years old, who along with his parents were murdered by Mau Mau fighters uh, in, in their home. He was sleeping in his bed. Um, and it became a cause celebre, as you can imagine, in Europe. Uh, look what these savages have done. Okay. Now, the next line then, to savages expendable as Jews. So this is a tough, tough line. I have a problem with this line. I, if I could talk with Derek Walcott, if he were still alive, I would have to ask him if he would still want to hold on to this line. And here's why. I understand when he says savages, he is, he's not talking about him, his own perspective. Like Nadine Gordimer, he is speaking in propria persona with a mask, the mask of the colonial oppressor who sees these individuals, these Mau Mau fighters, uh, these Kenyans as savage because they would do that. They would never ask why they were pushed to do that. They, they would just call them savages. And then he says, expendable as Jews. So that's intended to be provocative. We're intended to think uh, he's comparing He's comparing Kenyans to, to Jews in the Holocaust. I mean, there were six billion, I mean, uh, six million, I'm sorry, six million Jews um, uh, lost their lives at least in the Holocaust. Not, not even mentioning uh, Eastern Europeans, um, uh, people who were considered undesirable, right? But the, the vast majority were Jews. I mean, to, to see the Jews used as a benchmark is really, really tough. It's really, really hard. It's like when people decide that they're going to call their political opponent Hitler, regardless of where their political opponent stands on the political spectrum with respect to Hitler. I mean, I'll be honest, Gretchen Whitmer is the, op you know, is the opposite of Hitler. To call Gretchen Whitmer Hitler is really um, intellectually, you know, uh, in, impossible to to to, to uh, defend. It is an emotional response, right? Um, it is not an intellectual one. Well, this might be a bridge too far. We will have to talk about that. I'm sure you have opinions uh, about that, but that's what the poet is willing to do. The poet punches us right in the nose with this, you know, that 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 perhaps the British are guilty of the exact same mentality as the, um, the Germans with their final solution. That, of course, is not uh, a charge anyone in their right mind would want to be at all guilty of. So I'm going to leave you to read this, this particular slide, but it gives you a little bit of the history of the British settlement in, in um, Kenya and the Kikuyu, uh, one of the, the major tribes there, uh, just to say that it's the beginning of the 19th century when the British get there. Also, um, you can read this slide for yourself and you can see how the British uh, developed their original colonial interest trading posts into being a, a system, a systemic cultural domination. Now, this is a tough slide. I'm going to leave it to you. I've highlighted a couple of things, highlighted a couple of things. And uh, I, I warn you uh, in advance, these are atrocities. Uh, so you can either take my word for it and say that there were atrocities on both sides, but, but these atrocities uh, were, were precipitated by the British colonial action. There is no debating that they would not have happened if the British hadn't been there to begin with. But I can't deny uh, what happened to Michael Rucker, um, because then what you do is you get into a battle with people. And, and, and in fact, what, um, what Walcott is saying is, Walcott is admitting that there are atrocities on both sides. So I leave it to you to look and see. But I, I will tell you, again, I come down on, on the side of, of the natives more often. Uh, again, I'll, I'll leave this to you to read. Now, one of the things that I, I like to introduce to students when, when I'm, uh, I'm talking about the poem 
is Nietzsche, because I believe when he talks about the Superman, he's not talking about the guy in tights. He's talking about, about the concept of the Ubermensch, which Nietzsche introduces. Now, you can take a look at this. I have a couple of, of really, I think, very good links. So I encourage you to follow those links, and I encourage you to learn about this concept of the Superman. In a nutshell, here's what it is. All right. Most of us believe that we inherit our code of morality of right and wrong from our parents who inherit it from their parents, from the society around us, et cetera, et cetera. And at the, uh, the point of origin for all of these people is the supreme being, God, Yahweh, um, Allah, uh, you know, the name that you, that you give it, please give it, right? This is, um, this is called divine command theory, that, that the creator gave us morality and we must follow it. We are duty bound like soldiers to generals to follow orders. And when we're told thou shalt not kill, well, we shouldn't kill. Well, well what's interesting is then when the chosen people go to you know, the land in milk and honey, then they need to attack and kill. So apparently there's a little asterisk there that you're only not supposed to kill people in your own tribe. Uh, but you can kill your enemies. Well, this is the kind of thing that's problematic. What Nietzsche says is, okay, let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine there is no God. There is no divine command. Can we as human beings rationalize? Can we, you, using the powers of reason, deductively, inductively, can we construct a system, a legitimate authoritative system of morality that will be that will be equally applicable to all human beings, to Kikuyu and to, to English, and to Scots and to Irish, and to uh, the Chinese and to the Indian population, and, and to men, to women, to children, to adults, et cetera, et cetera. So, so Nietzsche works on this, and one of the things that he does is he creates a whole system that I don't really wanna go into here uh, about, uh, about how we can generate this, this system of rational thought. And he, be, he believes it begins with like people who are superstars, who rise, tower above the rest of us, and we know that. And so we, have, we, have, we recognize the quality, and so we give consent to that, that individual, enough consent, right? That individual attracts us, is a superstar because they have this, this driving force, which he calls the will to power, and this will to power makes, makes the individual want to do things which will be good, not only for her or himself, but for everybody, right? It's a kind of ce celebrity ethics program, in a way. Uh, and, uh, and so when, when the British go abroad, when they, they follow, the, the lead of people like Cecil Rhodes, they are giving themselves the banner of the Ubermensch. They are saying, we have the will to power, we are strong enough to do this, therefore we will do this, therefore our morality is good. It is the defining morality. Well, you can see how that becomes problematic because if you're strong enough to go into and impose your will on another, group of people, then you can say, I, uh, uh, accordingly, I justify everything that I do. Isn't that what we've done in this country? Isn't that what we've done with our native population? I mean, how do we, se how, do, how do most of us who are divided in the vein, how do we separate our various bloods and go in one direction or another, right? So Nietzsche is an interesting character, and we'll come back to him. All right, so I go to stanza two. Threshed out by beaters, the long rushes break in white dust of ibises whose cries have wheeled since civilization's dawn from the parched river or beast teeming plain. It's a beautiful image here. You can just, you can see it you know, on the felt there in front of Kilimanjaro. Threshed out. That this is uh, the, a part of the hunting ritual of native hunters. The, they will try to, to beat the tall grass 
and in doing so they will scare out the uh, the game and then the hunters can uh, can uh, attack their prey they are the beaters they beat the grass with sticks so that the animals are frightened out of their hiding places so that's the beaters thresh them out these long rushes that grow uh, in in, uh, in the ground these, these grasses and these beautiful ibis birds if you click on the the link or beside the line you can see pictures of them whose cries have wheeled since civilization's dawn so what what the poet reminds us and unfortunately oftentimes we need reminding is that is that africa has been has been determined by by scientists to have the earliest human uh, remains. So it it is arguably the cradle of all of our civilization. This is where we all come from. Okay, and and this is a reminder that this is home. Really, it should be home for all of us. So we should care deeply about Africa. Then he moves into some powerful lines, lines that are worth memorizing to carry with you for a lifetime. The violence of beast on beast is read as natural law. I mean, that's what we were talking about with Yeats. Uh, you know, watch a David Attenborough nature documentary, the old Disney films. Uh, like Shakespeare says, nature is red in tooth and claw. You're going to see lions bring down an impala. It's, that's how they survive. I mean, we do it in a different way, but if you, know, you eat meat, then it comes from some place. Maybe you didn't wring the neck of the chicken, but somebody did, uh, and uh, and that's the part of natural law. We 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 eat to survive. We kill, or we be we are going to be killed, right? Now, not everyone agrees with this philosophy, but it is, you know, a simple sort of poetic explanation of of violence in the world. Now, the second half is is the criticism is the important part but upright man seeks his divinity by inflicting pain first of all upright man upright is another ambiguous term upright means that you have evolved from the animals and you stand upright on your two hind legs right and you, you you're rational you're able to build systems and and transport yourself and organize communities and then fight community between community. You can do all these things, you are upright. Uh, but it also suggests that with your evolution, you should also have a kind of moral uprightness. This is what Peter Singer argues when he talks about animal rights. It's like, okay, yeah, the animals do eat one another, but we have evolved uh, with a rational system to where we can figure all, out alternatives, shouldn't we? Don't we have an, a moral duty and an obligation to stop eating animals as if they are subversions of ourselves when we have been given a superior intellect? Shouldn't we use that superior intellect to find an, a better way to treat animals? Well, that's a provocative and a very powerful question. So we do all need to take Peter Singer care, uh, uh, very seriously. But here's another moral and ethical um, accusation that the poet is making. But upright man seeks his divinity, his godlikeness by inflicting pain. So God is supposed to be love, we are told by the New Testament writers. But here, God is, is vengeful, powerful, destructive. We worship God because we fear God. We fear God because God can inflict pain on us. A bright man wants to be godlike and in so and in so doing will inflict pain must inflict pain if it if he wants to be godlike the violence of beast on beast is read as natural law it's instinctive but upright man seeks makes a conscious choice his divinity by inflicting pain violence is what makes you godlike Delirious as these worried beasts, his wars dance to the titan carcass of a drum. Titan carcass, there we are. 
we're back with tawny pelt again. The animal has been skinned. It's being used for something else. Now it's a drum. It, it announces the beat to which we will dance before we go to war. Well, he calls courage still, that native dread of the white peace contracted by the dead. All right, nature and these human beings, the natives and the interlopers, the, the imperialists, the colonials, they have a contract. That's not natural uh, in this scene. They have a contract. That contract is sealed by violence, not by mutual, uh, mutual um, survival. Let's go to stanza three, the final stanza. Here's another couple of lines worth, worth memorizing. Again, brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause. So now the poet comes out and is not ambiguous. The, po the, the, the poet comes out and says, this is dirty. It is immoral. It is beneath us. This is not how we should behave. This is not how we should act. Brutish necessity. Now, the question I have is, by necessity, is that a pejorative term again? I think so. But the people who are engaging in it, the people who have hired Orwell to be a subdivision of police officer, they think it's necessary. Orwell doesn't think it's necessary. Orwell doesn't want to be the business end of the stick anymore. He doesn't want to do what he calls the dirty business of the empire. He doesn't want to deliver the canings, the beatings. He doesn't want to throw people in cells anymore. He doesn't want to arrest and intimidate people. He doesn't want to then wipe his hands on the dirty cause by pointing out that it's important for the economy, for the folks back home, for you know, world peace, to keep order in, in the world, to dominate these natives. Again, again, brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause. Again, a waste of our compassion, as with Spain. Now he's talking about the Spanish Civil War and how it, the Spanish Civil War was a great international rallying cry for romantic figures, uh, people who wanted to resist oppression, and yet it did not it did not yield the resisting results that one would want it. The next line is the line that's very important. It's the one that I've positioned you for by talking about Nietzsche. The gorilla wrestles with the Superman. Okay, now this is an odd image. It's a strange analogy. It's a strange, it's a strange image, okay? Because you're tempted to think of Superman in tights, right? Um, and you're not given enough information to dissuade you from thinking that. Gorilla? So what you see is you see a, almost a literal wrestling match between the two, but it seems weird. I mean, the gorilla is a powerful native beast, but it is not capable of beating a man in tights. So maybe what we're not talking about is a man in tights. Maybe what we're talking about is an uber bench, which would make more sense because the gorilla then becomes this natural instinctive force in the same way like the, the moorhens the, the horse's hooves, <clears throat> the, the, the water in the stream that's flowing are dictated by nature, by the causation of nature. The gorilla exists in this native habitat because of nature. So it's sort of nature wrestling against the uber nature, the uber man, the people who've come from another place to this natural habitat to say, we are going to control it by an act of will, a will to power. The gorilla wrestles with the Superman. And when they do, they each use the tools of violence available to them. We stop the poem there. We stop, we stop this careening back and forth of tone between the pejorative and, and the vivid. The poet is going to address us directly and honestly. He's told a story, and now he wants to tell you how, he's told you how the stakes are raised, now he wants to tell you why it is he can't move on to the world as it should be. I, 
who am poisoned with the blood of both. Where shall I turn divided to the vein? How do you, how do you choose to, to stand with your people when both of the antagonists, both of the nemeses are your people? How do you choose? I mean, you can't choose based on blood, based on nature. I who have cursed the drunken officer of British rule. Well, this is clearly an, uh, an allusion to specific incidents that Walcott would have known and, and had that were painful and threatening. How choose between this Africa? This Again, that's the, the, the tawny pelt. The, 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 the place where Ibis's cries wheel uh, and have since the dawn of civilization. Th this incredibly beautiful place where you can look across the veldt, see giraffes, and in the background see cityscapes. How do you choose between this Africa and the English tongue I love? I mean, it's clear that Walcott has mastered uh, the use uh, and communication through the English language. He's not alone in this. The, I mean, Yeats is not writing in his native language. I mean, if you can call it his native language, because again, he's divided in the vein too. He's English and he's Irish. I mean, should he write in Gwailiga or should he write in English? I mean, he is considered one of the great writers in English along with Shakespeare. Betray them both, choose a side, choose no side, do nothing, or give back what they give. What do they give? Violence, frustration. Um, one of them gives uh, statistics. The other gives images of bloody violence. How can I face such slaughter and be cool? How can I do nothing? How can I turn from Africa and live? How can I not support the resistance in Africa against British colonial rule? and claim to be a man descended from Africans. Well, this is an incredibly impossible problem. And that's where we're left, right? To reinforce that, let's take a look at the rhyme scheme. You have hands is supposed to rhyme with Superman. Between that, you have again in Spain, an off rhyme, both, what, what is that supposed to rhyme with? Vain, with again in Spain. Again, these are not on rhymes. Cursed, what does that rhyme with at all? Um, choose, love, give, cool. Does that go with choose? Live. The, one, the words that I want you to focus on are love, give, and live. Those are the only ones that seem to stand out. They're, it's almost like the poet is, is trying to fit these, these Lego pieces together as much as he possibly can. Love and give, you have that, that V-E sound, but a different vowel sound. And then it's almost as if they're resolved. The differences are resolved in live. So love, give, live, love, give, live, all right? It's not much, but it's the best the poet can manage given the extreme and extremely violent, the extremely morally um, disembodied, you know, broken landscape that he has to exist in. Let me take us back to the very beginning, to the title of the poem, A Far Cry from Africa. It has two meanings. Meaning one, literal, a far cry from Africa. Here I am, the poet, Derek Walcott. I am listening to the cries of people, all people, on both sides of the issue, in pain, coming from Africa. But also there's the sense of a far cry, as in, a great distance. My, uh, my grandmother used to use the phrase a far cry. Well, that's a far cry from where we used to be or a far cry from what we used to think, great distance. 
So where we are in Africa now, this is a long way away from what Africa was. One assumes causally before the British got there to Kenya and created this colonial uh, monstrosity, which has led to all of this horrific violence. A far cry from Africa, a dilemma for the poet, beautiful African landscape, culture, native culture, English, beautiful language and language creating a literary culture. How does an individual reconcile these things? So I leave you with those thoughts. Thanks for listening. I very much appreciate it. And I'm hoping that this is helpful. I'll also put up a discussion to allow you to ask the questions that you would like to ask. Thanks very much.